Welcome to Occult Experiments in the Home, Magic, Spirituality and the Paranormal, in Personal Experience and in Practice. From Buddhism comes the concept of the near enemy. A near enemy is a negative quality that looks a lot like a positive quality, and because this idea comes from the domain of Buddhism. By positive quality, what's generally meant is a quality that, when cultivated, leads towards awakening. And a negative quality, on the other hand, being one that leads away from this in the opposite direction, which sustains or strengthens the illusion of a separate permanent self. As you might imagine, these near enemies are very pernicious, very dangerous, because they can easily pass themselves off as something good. And if they do manage to sneak themselves past our awareness, then they can become really entrenched and do a lot of damage. For example, one of the near enemies of compassion is pity. If it's pity that we're feeling rather than compassion, that may well still motivate us to help people, even to put others before ourselves in order to ensure that they're okay. So it can be pretty indistinguishable from compassion from an outward perspective. However, true compassion has the etymology of the word itself suggests is about suffering with somebody. It's about recognising in them the suffering that can and does also afflict ourselves, and then consequently joining together with that person in understanding, in commonality, but pity, on the other hand, is an emotion, a quality that's doing something quite different. When we pity somebody, we're separating ourselves from them, putting them over there. And although it can very easily be dressed up to look like compassion from the outside, what we're actually feeling when we pity somebody is not the other person suffering at all. Our generosity is motivated by, really, a sense of relief that we're not in the place that they are. Pity is an attitude that actually bolsters our own sense of our own position. And it's often just a hair breadth away from a kind of contempt for the other person. So what I'm going to attempt to do in this episode is to explore what I consider to be some near enemies to magic. The definition of magic I generally use is Alan Chapman's. Alan suggested magic is the art of experiencing truth. With respect to that definition of magic, I'm going to suggest that three of the near enemies of magic are art, history, and psychology. Those three all present various aspects that might look as if they're relevant to the understanding and practice of magic, but in actuality, I would argue, they're not. They're near enemies. And if we fall into the trap of mistaking them for magic, then our magical practice will be undermined. If we mistake art for magic, then, I suggest, our understanding of magic will be undermined. If we mistake history for magic, then what gets attacked and undermined is our practice. And if we mistake psychology for magic, then what will suffer is the effects of our magic, its results. And what I hope to do over the rest of the episode is unpack all of that and hopefully show how that might be the case. 
back in 1974, the magnificent Lionel Snail, writing as Ramsey Dukes, published a book known as Sosotbame, S-S-O-T-B-M-E, which stood for Sex Secrets of the Black Magicians Exposed. And the book had nothing to do with that whatsoever, but what it did do was define magic as a kind of culture in distinction to three other cultures, art, religion and science. The reason I bring it up here is really by way of contrast. Art, magic, science and religion are not necessarily enemies to each other in this account. So in contrast, what I'm focusing on here is very much the way in which certain perspectives and ideas from other disciplines can smuggle themselves into magic and do harm there. But there's another possible near enemy of magic that I wanted to address before looking at the others. And this is philosophy. Sometimes philosophizing about magic can seem as if it is a true engagement with magical work, when in fact it's actually detracting from that. But my reason for setting this one a bit apart from the others is that philosophy, as it was originally practiced by the ancient Greeks, was magic. The word philosophy, meaning the love of truth, back in the day was a a praxis, a form of contemplation that led one into a direct experience of the truth. Over the millennia, what we've come to understand as philosophy in our culture is something very different. Postmodernism, the current dominant form of philosophy at the moment, actually averse that there is no such thing as truth. Philosophy, as we encounter it today, can be a near enemy of magic, because in its supposed absence of truth, everything gets reduced to belief. In chaos magic, for instance, which is a form of magic particularly influenced by postmodernist thinking, there's the concept of belief shifting, and the idea that by changing our beliefs we change reality. This does have a limited validity, of course. But if that really were the full picture, then all that magic could ever be about would be changing our opinions, changing our beliefs. Postmodernism is a near enemy of magic because if we let that kind of thinking in, then what I've just described is as far as we'll ever get. What I'm trying to do here is genuinely to try to reach for the truth about something called magic that's real, that we can talk about meaningfully, and hopefully by contemplating it deeply in the way that I try to do here, arrive at a better understanding, a more direct experience of it. So much for philosophy then. So now let's turn our attention to perhaps the most insidious near enemy of magic, art. Because it's true, these two do have a lot in common. Magical work, rituals, they often involve making things, producing images. And it's understandable that we want them to look good, because the better they look, the more inspiring they are, and the more power that they bring to our magical work. Take a sigil for instance. In practice a sigil can be any kind of squiggle that you want it to be but personally I think I'm like a whole lot of other people in wanting a sigil to look good. It's got to look right, it's got to look as if it's doing something that it means business. Magic has an aesthetic dimension to it, and that aesthetic is an important part of it. For instance, I think there's a very distinct Thelemic aesthetic, and a distinct Wiccan aesthetic, 
and a very characteristic chaos magic aesthetic as well. And we may find ourselves resonating strongly with one or other of these, or on the contrary, wanting to go off and do something that diverges from them distinctly. Something that looks good, something that's beautiful, is on its way perhaps to being true. And just to spell out, when I say beauty here, I don't mean, of course, things being pretty or nice. But the beauty of something being that quality that gives us that feeling of yes, that sensation of rightness, of really hitting the mark when we see it. I think it's fair to say that in art, that feeling of rightness, that beauty, is the most important thing of all. This was perhaps most directly and succinctly expressed by the poet John Keats in his Ode on a Grecian Urn. That famous line, beauty is truth, truth beauty. But it's not as simple here as Keats saying that beauty and truth are the same thing. Those famous words in the poem are in quotation marks. And when read in context, what Keats is doing there is imagining the work of art itself, the Grecian urn, saying those words to future generations. What's being shown here, maybe, is not how beauty and truth are or can be the same thing, because obviously they're not but how the function of a work of art, perhaps, is to tell us that they are. We don't want art to (laughs) tell us what's true. That's going to probably be some pretty boring art. Instead, we want it to show or reveal something to us. That's part of what elicits that beauty response, I think, that sense of being really connected to something that feels really worth being connected with. So, if magic is the art of experiencing truth, then is art actually all about experiencing beauty? Well, there are a lot of magicians who are also accomplished artists. Alan Moore, for instance, has often gone on the record to say that art and magic are, if not identical, then at least virtually indistinguishable. Grant Morrison has famously described his graphic novel, The Invisibles, as a hyper-sigil, which I suppose implies that it functions on two levels, on one level as a work of art in its own right, but also having a magical intention to manifest specific effects in the real world. From a magical perspective, of course, this maybe begs the question why Grant Morrison went to such extraordinary lengths to construct this symbol for his magical intention when he could have just jotted any old squiggle on a piece of paper. But of course, that... (laughs) doesn't detract from the standing of the invisibles as a work of art at all. Although maybe the extent to which an act of magic relies upon the form it takes in order to produce its effects, the more we find ourselves moving into the domain of art. I've had A lot of discussion about this specific issue with Tommy Kelly, whose podcast and other magical ventures can be found on the Adventures in Woo Woo website. Tommy is another person who's a magician and an artist, and he made one point that really stayed with me, which is that when he makes art and when he performs magic... To him, it often feels the same. It feels at a deep level like they're the same activity. And that makes sense to me. I really do agree that 
the making of a work of art and an act of magic can amount to exactly the same activity. But I find myself aware also of instances where maybe that's not the case. The dawn of conceptual art has been a bit of a gift to magicians. When conceptual art came along, it meant that pretty much anything could be said to be a work of art. Sometimes, as a magician, you might want to do some magical work outdoors or in a public place. If you're part of a sizable group, then occasionally you might need to rent a public building in order to meet. The gift of conceptual art to magicians has been that we can disguise our magical activities as art to the general public. When we rent public premises, we can say, oh, we're a local theatre group rehearsing a performance so that nobody on the premises is disturbed by anything that they might see or overhear. And if anyone interrupts a ritual outdoors, we can always say it's a performance piece or we're making a film or something. The fact that when we're doing magic in public, we might use art as a cover in case anyone challenges us exposes, I think, the fact that although they might look the same, they might feel the same, they might amount to the same activities, deep down at the level of what we intend by them, art and magic can't be the same. Because in the glare of public scrutiny, we know that if we're intending to make art, that will attract significantly less hostility on the whole than if we intend to practice magic. To think back to Keats's Grecian urn, it's okay for a work of art to try to convince us that it's true by being beautiful, because we know that truth and beauty aren't really the same thing. So when the caretaker unexpectedly stumbles into the church hall and there's a group of people in black robes chanting in a circle, if they're the local theatre group, then so what? <laughs> they're probably just trying to put on a decent play and entertain some people. But if it's apparent that it's not the local theatre group on the premises but a group of magicians performing some sort of ritual intended to have some sort of actual effect upon reality, whether the caretaker believes that's possible or not, he or she is likely to possibly take a different view. It's fine for art to claim to be true through being beautiful, but a magician isn't putting on a ritual as something to be appraised and enjoyed. A magical act is aiming to bring about a change in reality directly, regardless of anyone else's attitude towards that. And it's that, understandably, that to someone for whom magic is not a reality and something that every human being has at their disposal. It's that which can arouse feelings of suspicion and hostility and fear. And another thing I think that plainly distinguishes between art and magic is the skill sets are different. It takes a certain talent and experience to be able to create something beautiful. Some Magicians are also artists, but I don't have much in the way of any artistic talent. Yet, thankfully, I don't think that's prevented me from practising magic. As I see it, there's no reason why artistic talent and magical talent can't exist side by side in the same person and can't supplement and heighten one another. 
But nevertheless, it is possible for art to become a near enemy of magic. In episode 81 of the podcast Weird Studies, Phil Ford and J.F. Martell discuss a novel by M. John Harrison called The Course of the Heart. I strongly recommend both the podcast episode and the novel if you haven't come across them. M. John Harrison's novel is about magic, it's about synchronicity, it's about the existence of other worlds and other realms of being and how those can maybe be accessed from this world through meaning, experiences of deep, profound, unexpected meaning. I'm not going to attempt a plot summary because, to be honest, I can't remember the plot. The writing is absolutely exquisite and what Harrison seems to be doing is really concentrating on the evocation of a certain mood, a certain feeling, using language in a way that perhaps only language can be used to evoke a almost overwhelming experience of the intensity of the meaning of things. As soon as I'd heard the podcast, I had to lay hands on a copy of the book and I wasn't disappointed in the slightest. I read the book over the course of two days in the garden of my partner's father's house who had recently died and I was helping her clear the house and my main job was burning all of the things that that we couldn't find any other means of disposing of and it was autumn and there was a smell of smoke and this if anything intensified even more my experience my reading of the novel phil and jf in the podcast episode find themselves drawn into a discussion by the novel of all the Many types of things that Weird Studies ends up focusing on, such as the nature of synchronicity, the nature of reality, the reality of magic, and the dangers associated with practicing magic. But I was really surprised and disappointed when, in the course of a discussion about the novel, and M. John Harrison, with a listener to this podcast, Christian. He, Christian, pointed me to a blog post on Harrison's blog, where he gave his reaction to the Weird Studies episode. This podcast returned the whole 1980s to me, writes Harrison, in one vast rush. By being the response I would have wanted then, I'm still happy, he goes on, to define both immanence and transcendence as properties of the continual emergence of the whole from relations at a deeper level. But if it's the universe, it's the universe. It's always already the quotidian. Anything else is a beautiful metaphor you fall in love with. If the universe is emergent, he says a bit later, It doesn't have to know what it is, and only the anthropocentric subjectivity, essentially linguistic, can produce the illusion that it does, or that it can be viewed from that illusory standpoint. The thing is always the thing. You can only deny that by imagining yourself viewing it from the temporary grammatical platform of the next level up or down. It's language that enables that position to be taken. So this novel, this beautiful, evocative novel that so exquisitely evokes a sense of transcendent realms and other worlds and which J.F. Martell and Phil Ford agree is a very Gnostic book turns out to have been written by somebody who doesn't believe in the possibility of transcendence at all. For Harrison... What appears to be transcendence is only an effect of language. And as a writer, as an artist, 
as an extremely talented writer, he sees it as his job to employ those resources of language to their maximum effect. In another article on his blog, he writes about his love of metaphysics, but how he doesn't mistake metaphysics as a serious description of how things actually are. I'm just on the lookout for a glittery concept, he writes, a slippery notion, or a deeply debatable cognitive structure I can make fiction with. I found this a bit crushing when I read it, but it is a fine example, I think, of how art can function as the near enemy of magic. Harrison appreciates the episode of Weird Studies that discusses his work, but he enjoys it not because he agrees with the conclusions that Phil and J.F. draw from it, but apparently because it has elicited from them the response he was setting out to evoke from his readers. The response I would have wanted is how he describes it. He hasn't given us truth, which is the experience we seek through magic. He's given us a beautiful picture of truth. To appreciate the difference, all we have to do maybe is turn to a writer like Philip K. Dick, who was also profoundly fascinated by ideas from the Gnostic tradition. Dick, through his writing, I think, is very much exploring how the Gnostic view of reality can very much be experienced as real, as true. Dick's aim is not to beguile us with an overpowering sense that reality is actually something other than what he really believes it is. On the contrary, Dick, through his writing, is trying to show us, I think, that reality is truly something other from what we might take it to be. That's a magical approach, that's a magical intention, and Dick was a magician and an artist, I think. And Harrison, well, from what he says, I don't think he would be disappointed to be described as an artist first and foremost. The brilliance of his writing is not in question here. But maybe it does illustrate rather well why, in Plato's Republic, Socrates made that ancient and still very controversial decision to ban artists from his ideal city-state. Or rather... He bans them very reluctantly, and really only those artistic works that rely upon imitation for their effect. Imitation is far removed from the truth, says Socrates, for it touches only a small part of each thing, and a part that is itself only an image. And that, it seems, is why it can produce everything, For example, we say that a painter can paint a cobbler, a carpenter, or any other craftsman, even though he knows nothing about these crafts. Nevertheless, if he is a good painter and displays his painting of a carpenter at a distance, he can deceive children and foolish people into thinking that it is truly a carpenter. So, in this vein, although... It might be said of Philip K. Dick that he was a Gnostic. M. John Harrison, in The Course of the Heart, has, in effect, instead presented us with a very, very good picture of a Gnostic. When art is acting as the near enemy of magic, what gets lost is truth. We get a picture of the truth, but what's lacking from it is a genuine understanding on the part of the artist. There's no real understanding of that truth there, but just, instead, artifice. So, passing on to our next near enemy of magic, history. <laughs>
maybe it's a bit of an extreme view of mine, but I really don't think that history matters to the practice of magic. And I think this attitude of mine stems probably from the conceptual frameworks that have guided me down the years. First of all, perhaps chaos magic. The idea that you don't need to follow any particular tradition or set of ideas. You can invent stuff as you go along. And if there is any validity to that approach, then what arises from it is the idea that that's what every magician has always been doing down the centuries. Maybe some people have resonated with a certain tradition or set of teachings and they've preferred to adhere to those, to follow those. But in the history of magic, when we look at the origin of those traditions or teachings themselves, whether we're thinking of figures like Crowley or Dee and Kelly or Helena Blavatsky, what those teachings and traditions have stemmed from ultimately is some kind of attempt to open up to the absolute or open up to some being or entity that then gives us what we're looking for. In this sense, every magical tradition comes from stuff that's made up or borrowed or invented. And people might follow a particular tradition and feel identified with that tradition as if they belong there, as if it resonates with them. But ultimately, whatever that tradition is, it it goes back to that original act of the material being made up or channeled by whoever the founder happens to be. All traditions in magic are then, in a sense, illusory. There is no golden thread of knowledge stretching back to the dawn of time. It has just been folks in different places, in different eras, reinventing the wheel over and over again. And chaos magic is not much different in that respect. It has its aesthetic, it has its founding figures. Some people might like to model their practice on these. And chaos magic is maybe just a little bit more explicit about this. A bit more ironic and meta and positioning itself as the tradition that isn't a tradition. Although, fundamentally, it's just more of the same. And the other conceptual framework that has shaped my assumptions, I think, is perennialism. I am a bit of a perennialist, which is the idea that ultimately there is one truth, and that one truth presents itself to people over and over again, but in all sorts of different ways taking all sorts of different forms. There seems to be a notion in the mainstream, a suspicion of perennialism as being aligned with a conservative or even a fascist ideology. If I thought that were the case, of course I wouldn't align myself with it. I think perennialism does tend to get confused with and wrapped up with another philosophical approach, traditionalism. And certainly traditionalism is, by its nature, at least conservative. And many traditionalists are also likely to be perennialists. And this combination has given rise to figures on the far right of occultism, like Judas Evola, um, Steve Bannon... Um, and Alexander Durgin. Traditionalism holds that there's one truth, um, that this has found its greatest expression in the major world religions, and so we need to cling on to those traditions. We need to return to them where we might have fallen away from them, and that falling away from them or new or individual traditions 
expressions of that truth aren't truth at all but a decadent corrupt. That's not a view I find myself in agreement with. It's been my experience so far that there is just one truth. Because as a chaos magician I've borrowed all sorts of practices from all sorts of places and yet they've all led me back to the same experience of the absolute. And I think there is only one truth because of course oneness is a quality of truth. Although I think it's the case that not all traditions or paths to the truth are of equal value. Well, so what? (laughs) Just because somebody might be on a path that's not the most direct, might be a bit rough, might even lead to a dead end, that doesn't mean that they're not going to get to where they want to go eventually, that they won't find a way past the obstacles or through the rough patch, or that they might not hop off and join an adjoining path that does take them where they want to go. In my view, there is one truth, and there is a multiplicity of different expressions of that truth. And yes, they are really different, and they do have different status and values, but this multiplicity is inevitable and a part of being human, And although the older ones are more likely to have stood the test of time for good reasons, that's not necessarily true, just as it's not necessarily true that a new tradition is obviously inferior. In magic, the art of experiencing truth, personal experience always has to be our ultimate guide. And maybe I've said enough now for it to start to become apparent how history, taking a historical perspective on magic, acts as a near enemy to the practice of magic itself. For instance, somebody might say that they've had the magical experience known as the knowledge and communication of the Holy Guardian Angel. Someone else might point out that it was Alistair Crowley who came up with that term for that experience. If the person making the claim that they have had the same experience of Alistair Crowley isn't particularly familiar with Alistair Crowley's work, didn't use the same methods as Alistair Crowley to arrive at that experience, then... From a historicist perspective, that claim doesn't seem to hold much weight. How can someone claim to have had the same experience as Crowley if they didn't do what Crowley did, and if they don't follow in the same tradition? History is the study of the past, and if we take an approach to magic that's too historical, then the truth may well seem to lie in the experience of the tradition that we're considering, rather than in our own personal direct experience, regardless of any tradition. We're confronted with the sense in which the Buddha was not a Buddhist, Jesus Christ was not a Christian, Jung was not a Jungian, and inevitably Crowley was not a Thelemite. They all had direct personal experiences of the truth. They were not followers of the traditions that they handed down to us, because, of course, they hadn't formulated those traditions at that point. They just presumably had to muddle their way through using whatever was available to them at the time, whatever was useful. The traditions they left behind are presumably giving us a path that's easier or better in some respect than the one that they themselves had to follow. But they were (laughs) all like chaos magicians, in a sense, improvising as they went along, presumably. 
And what they've handed down to us comes not so much from what they found themselves doing or thinking, but from that direct personal experience of the truth that they found at the end of the path. That truth, I suspect, is the same for everybody for all time. So, an overly historical approach in magic may sometimes thwart us from progressing towards that in our practice by convincing us that the truth lies instead in the tradition itself. And finally, we come to our third near enemy of magic, psychology. And of course, I do tend to use a lot of psychological concepts here. I do try to be careful with that, but no doubt I've probably slipped sometimes into ways of thinking that are perhaps so psychological they cease to be magical. So what I wanted to do was at least to signal that danger and say something about what I think that means. What's actually happening when we fall away from magic into psychology and what the impacts on magical practice are likely to be from that. In the context of chaos magic, we might come across talk of the psychological paradigm, and this is sometimes contrasted with the spirit paradigm. And these are both conceptual frameworks that can guide us when we're interacting with entities, whether they're demons, gods, elemental spirits, whatever. In the spirit paradigm, we regard these as separate beings with their own agency, whereas if we take up the psychological paradigm, we're understanding them more as aspects of ourselves that we're projecting onto the external world as a way of objectifying them and then being able to perceive them more clearly and work with them and interact with them in some way. If we have some kind of attachment difficulty or addiction, say, then we might regard that as a demon that we want to constrain or bind or put its energy to use in a more useful direction instead. And if we have an ideal or an aspiration, some quality that we feel we don't currently have but we want to incorporate, then we might want to express that psychological lack in the form of devotion to an image of a deity that embodies that quality that's missing. So in the psychological paradigm, there's not so much a sense that entities are real, existing things in their own realm, but rather it's us that animates them. We give them life, we give them existence by projecting our own internal life upon them. In a chaos magical context, as practical as ever, these two paradigms are both considered equally valid. As long as they get you the results that you want, then from this perspective it doesn't matter which paradigm you choose. But maybe it's not as simple as that. Crowley, for instance, was a great psychologizer of magic, and yet famously he too struggled a bit over the difference between these so-called paradigms. In his edition of the Goetia, for instance, he describes the goetic demons as portions of the human brain, which suggests a predominantly psychological approach, but in later years, apparently, he swung back towards the spirit paradigm instead. My take on this is that if you choose the psychological paradigm and you do some magical work in that paradigm, then it seems to me very likely that the results you will get from that working 
will be psychological in nature too. So in that case, have we actually done any magic or have we just done a bit of psychology on ourselves? Nothing wrong with that, especially if it gives us the result that we're aiming for. But maybe we've not done anything that we wouldn't have found in the pages of a book on Gestalt psychotherapy or CBT. If magic is the art of experiencing truth, then truth has a lot of different dimensions to it. Truth has a subjective dimension in that truth can be experienced subjectively and also some things can be subjectively true. It's true for me at the moment that I'm speaking into a microphone, probably not true for you. And yet truth has objective dimensions too. Two plus two equals four is objectively true for the both of us at all times. And indeed that's probably true whether the human species ever existed or not. So if we choose a psychological paradigm and we see the magical work as consisting in encountering subjective states and producing changes in subjective states, then very possibly we're limiting the experience of truth that we can have. We're reducing the possibility of accessing those objective dimensions. A good place to find out more about those objective dimensions is perhaps the work of Carl Jung. Since the publication of the Red Book and the Black Books, it's become clear that Jung was a magician and a mystic who presented himself very carefully as a psychologist. And so it's no accident at all, I think, that Jung's psychology is one that presents a model of the human mind with objective characteristics as well as subjective ones. Not to go into a great amount of detail, of course, but Jung's psychology is unique in that it offers a dimension of the mind called the collective unconscious, which contains images, ideas, the so-called archetypes that he suggests have been with us since the dawn of our species. Ideas supposedly relevant to everyone through all time, and therefore an aspect of the mind that does have that kind of objective quality of truth. Psychology in its present day form generally tends to focus on what goes on in the individual mind. There's not so much a notion of mind being something that's trans-individual or somehow shared. If people report experiences of knowing the thoughts of others or experiences of contact with entities that aren't physical and yet have some kind of objectivity to them, then that's generally regarded as a form of disease. Thinking about meditation, mindfulness meditation is regarded as a psychologically healthy thing to do, as long as it's in the service of relaxation, reducing stress or counteracting negative thoughts. In other words, encountering subjective states and producing subjective changes in those states. But <laughs> meditation since time immemorial has been used for far more than that. Jung certainly wasn't the first person on earth to recognise the objective dimensions of the psyche, the mind. In meditation, for instance, thinking of some of the things I've talked about here, I've had encounters with a version of myself that's female and other kinds of discarnate beings 
and also direct experiences of the absolute, the divine. Meditation actually provides access to the subjective and the objective dimensions of truth, all of it. It's usually one of the first techniques you use when you begin learning magic because it is the magical practice par excellence. And that connection with something objective is what meditation has always been used for. Yet those are precisely the aspects that psychology will tend to take a dim view of. Because they're not subjective, they're regarded as pathological. And because psychology tends to limit the mind to the subjective, that's why psychology can act as a near enemy to magic. Anyway, some controversial stuff perhaps, but hopefully something there to help you reflect on your own practice and keeping it magical. Thanks for listening and remember as ever that you can support the podcast and help keep it going by joining the Patreon at patreon.com slash O-E-I-T-H or if Patreon isn't your thing then there's some information in the notes so you can send a one-off donation if you'd like to or buy me a lovely book but in any case take care and hopefully we'll get to speak again soon bye bye